Hello, I'm Robert Grimaud from Brave New Films, and those of you who are watching around the country, sometimes around the world, welcome to our semi-regular live stream events. There have been a few, and there are a lot more coming up. I'll just mention that on June 18th, the executive director of Cherlop, Angelica Salas, will be speaking, asking questions. On June 25th, Pagan Harleman, who is the executive director producer of The Trade, the really great documentary miniseries on Showtime, for those of you who haven't seen it and have questions. And on July 26th, the one and only Dolores Huerta will be joining us. So mark your calendars. And if you have questions, where do we send the questions? Somebody tell me. Just comment in the Facebook Live. Um, Say that. Just comment your questions. go to our Facebook page. And with that, I'm going to turn the conversation over to Leah Welch, one of our associate producers. Welcome, Kent Wong, who is director of the UCLA Labor Center, where he teaches labor studies and ethnic studies. And among his many accomplishments, I'd like to say, including founding president of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, uh, staff attorney for the Service Employees International Union and representing Los Angeles County workers and you're also an author. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what the UCLA Labor Center does. Great. I first wanted to start by thanking my good friends at Brave New Films and uh, we feel so privileged to be in Los Angeles and having such a wonderful institution that truly has national and international reach and um, I really have tremendous respect for Robert and the work that you do. Uh, the UCLA Labor Center has been in existence for more than 50 years, and we serve as a bridge between the university and the broader labor community. We feel very fortunate here in Los Angeles to have a very dynamic labor movement that has been spearheading the call around economic justice that secured a huge victory in the passage of the $15 minimum wage. Mm -hmm. uh, Los Angeles has been at the forefront of immigrant worker organizing, some of the most dynamic organizing campaigns in the country have emerged right here in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles is home to some very dynamic and vibrant labor and community alliances and partnerships that are very much uh, grounded in uh, worker rights, racial justice, and immigrant justice. So we feel very fortunate at the UCLA Labor Center to partner very closely with um, the labor movement to provide opportunities for our students at UCLA to engage in fellowship and internship opportunities with labor and to document and to record what is going on with the um, labor movement, not only here in Los Angeles, but across the country. I was watching an interview that you did with uh, True Grit TV back in 2013, and you mentioned the labor movement, and I just wondered, could you define in that interview, use a new labor movement? Are you speaking about um, POC or women? Can you define that a little bit? Absolutely. So, um, the U.S. economy has fundamentally changed over the past several decades. The birth of the contemporary labor movement occurred back in the 1930s in the height of the Great Depression. Uh, and it, it grew out of uh, basic organizing in manufacturing sectors in this country. The auto workers, the steel workers, uh, the rubber workers, uh, the mine workers. Uh, since that time, there has been a fundamental shift in the U.S. economy from a manufacturing economy to a service economy. We've had a huge expansion in the number of women at work and the number of people of color and the number of immigrants. And so I do think that there is a new working class that has emerged across the country and that we have to have a new labor movement to address the contemporary needs and concerns of this new working class. Well said. Um, so just this past week, I'm sure all of you know that the Supreme Court banned workers from joining class action lawsuits so will you make a prediction for us? Um, what does this mean for the future of low-paid immigrant workers specifically? So this is a very dangerous time for unions. It's a very dangerous time for workers. We have seen uh, now all three federal branches of government dominated by very hostile anti-union, anti-worker, anti-immigrant, anti-women, anti-LGBT, the list goes on, anti-environmental. Um, and um, as a consequence, uh, decisions are coming out of the U.S. Supreme Court that are very bad yeah. for workers, for the environment, for women, 
uh, for people of color. And this uh, recent decision is going to dramatically undermine and limit class action lawsuits against corporations. So it is a straight out uh, uh, attack on worker rights and a straight out gift to corporations who want to avoid liability. I 100% agree with you. So pick one thing that you hoped for for the future of the American workforce. In spite of these dark times, I'm actually quite hopeful and optimistic for the future. And if we think back here in the state of California, 20 years ago, we had a Republican governor mm -hmm. who was elected based on a racist anti-immigrant campaign known as Proposition 187. 57% of the voters in the state of California supported this draconian, racist, anti-immigrant proposition that called for the expulsion of 500,000 children from public schools in the state of California. And yet, that passage of Prop 187 and the re-election of Pete Wilson actually uh, signified the death of the California Republican Party as we know it. Uh, and that there was a huge upsurge in, uh, in citizenship, a huge upsurge in voter registration, especially mm -hmm. by the Latino community, but also by the Asian community. And that it fundamentally flipped the um, state of California from a purple state to a blue state. And uh, I'm very proud that, you know, in spite of the horrible results at the national level in 2016, California did great. You know, we have super democratic majorities in the Senate and the Assembly. We have every single statewide office held by a Democrat. We have some of the most progressive legislation passed, some of the uh, best environmental standards, best immigrant rights, um, economic justice initiatives. So I think that uh, the Trump administration does not speak for the majority of people. There, there is no way he will ever, he didn't win the majority vote, and there's no way ever that his message of sexism, racism, and uh, anti-immigrant sentiment will be able to mobilize the majority in this country. And so I think that he's a very polarizing force. I think that he has really whipped a very ugly underbelly within our society that embraces some of the most vile, disgusting, anti-immigrant, racist sentiments. But that is not where America is. And that does not represent the hopes and aspirations of the majority of people in this country. So I think that um, this is, yes, a temporary, unfortunate uh, dynamic that we have in Washington, D.C., but I am actually very hopeful for the future. That's great. Um, so what actions can you recommend to all of us and all of the people watching uh, to help labor movement? This is a time of uh, a growth in social movements. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen all across the country teachers in red states going on strike. And it has struck a chord because there is something very wrong in this country where we have such terrible underfunding of our public schools and that we are not investing in the most precious natural resource within our country, which is our children. And people understand that on a very basic level. Everybody who sends their kids to public schools knows that they're not being well served in terms of providing the best quality public education that we can provide because they're being starved. And public teachers are making low wages and uh, almost without exception have to use their own resources, money from their own pockets, to pay for basic supplies for their children. So what's wrong with this picture and how can we challenge it and change it. So this new wave of uh, teacher strikes all across the country gives me tremendous hope for the future. The fact that we had the largest women's demonstration in U.S. history the day after the inauguration, uh, and the fact that there is still a robust and dynamic women's movement that is calling out sexual assault and sexual abuse, that is calling out uh, you know, patriarchal institutions, uh, I think that that's a really good thing. The fact that we have Black Lives Matter, the fact that we have an opposition to systemic police brutality and systemic mass incarceration that uh, are locking up large numbers of uh, black and brown young men, and the fact that we have a dynamic and robust immigrant rights movement and immigrant youth movement, you know, massive protests across the country to stop deportations and to stop the attacks on immigrant communities. The fact that thousands of people rallied 
at airports on their own after Trump's attempt to ban Muslims from coming into this country uh, reflects uh, hope for the future. And I think that's where we really need to grow uh, social movements to uh, lead the resistance. Great. I'm going to turn it over to my fellow Brave New Film. Happened to bring a copy of it right here, so this is a this is a show and tell. But uh, it's wonderful. this book, Nonviolence and Social Movements, came out of a class that Reverend Lawson and I teach on nonviolence at UCLA. And for the past 16 years, we have taught this class, and we have engaged students about the philosophy of nonviolence and the role that young people historically have played to change the course of history. And so it is so powerful to sit there and listen to an 89-year-old Reverend Lawson, who can still lecture for two hours without notes, uh, share stories about his work in building the lunch counter sit-in movement, in training an 18-year-old John Lewis in civil disobedience, and in working with a new generation of civil rights leaders and activists to dismantle segregation and the apartheid style system that existed throughout the South and in many parts of this country. And so this book actually grew out of a graduate seminar that we taught together to both capture Reverend Lawson's teachings on nonviolence, but also to examine critical social movements throughout the last 60 years that have been inspired by the philosophy of nonviolence and have been effective precisely because of that embrace of nonviolence. And that includes the Montgomery bus boycott, the lunch counter sit-in campaigns. I was very glad to hear that you're inviting in the Lotus Webber, the founders of the United Farm Workers, because the great boycott was very much grounded in the philosophy of nonviolence and led to the first breakthrough union contracts for farm workers in the Central Valley of California. Reverend Lawson worked uh, with a new generation of immigrant workers right here in Los Angeles with the hotel workers, with the Justice for Janitors, and inspired a new organizing culture grounded in nonviolence. And the last chapter talks about the immigrant youth movement and this whole new wave of immigrant youth who have put their lives on the line and have risked arrest and deportation to fight for humane immigration policies, to demand uh, DACA, to demand the Federal Dream Act. And even though the Trump administration is viciously and aggressively attacking these immigrant youth. They represent the hope for the future, and Donald Trump represents the decaying racist infrastructure that has no future in this country. Yes. <laughs> Um, not good. Uh, the tech industry, uh, while it try and tries to promote uh, a hip image and they offer free food and cappuccino machines and um, you know it's supposed to be a fun place to work, in reality they have replicated some of the worst class and racial divisions and have replicated this uh, imbalance within our society. And so we've actually done a lot of work in organizing immigrant youth up in the Silicon Valley to try to demand change. And that the reality is that Silicon Valley is wholly reliant on immigrant labor mm -hmm. from all of the uh, engineers and H-1B visa holders who have played an instrumental role in the growth of Silicon Valley to all of the service workers who clean the buildings, mow the lawns, and take care of the children and the elderly within that community. And yet in spite of that, you have this massive infusion of wealth that is concentrated at the hands of a few, and you have a proliferation of poverty jobs, mainly through contract labor. Mm -hmm. So uh, while you know, the few that got on early on and were able to cash in on their shares in you know, the high-tech companies that are now you know, millionaires and billionaires, unfortunately, the uh, benefits of Silicon Valley have not been fairly distributed. 
And furthermore, there has been a horrendous racial imbalance where so few African Americans and Latinos have even been allowed in the door. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know our work in organizing the Silicon Valley, we have a very robust labor movement there. The Justice for Janitors have scored major victories in organizing uh, the janitorial industry in the Silicon Valley. We also have a very robust immigrant youth movement that is trying to make inroads in both providing economic opportunities for immigrant youth within the high-tech firms, but also demanding that they step forward and to be a force for uh, immigrant rights and for uh, social justice. And so uh, this summer in August, we're um, organizing a hackathon up in the Silicon Valley with uh, undocumented immigrant youth activists across the country to use apps and platforms to defend the rights of immigrants at this critical time. community work in LA Chinatown. My father was the uh, first Chinese American judge in the country at a time when uh, very few people of color were even allowed into law school. And in spite of that, when we moved into our home in Silver Lake um, back in the 1950s before I was born, my parents had to fight a racially restrictive covenant that prevented people of color from moving into Silver Lake. And they had to deal with the petitions signed by uh, many of our neighbors that were trying to keep our family out. So um, even in spite of the fact that you know, both of my parents were very successful and were pioneers in their own right, uh, being a person of color within the society, uh, you face discrimination and racism from the day you're born. And so uh, my parents shared the story with us that, they, you know, that we need to understand that it was a challenge to break the color barrier in Silver Lake. And that, uh, uh, you know, that although they uh, knew that many of their neighbors had signed the petition to keep us out, they also knew that uh, they had to uh, develop positive relations with everyone within our community. So even from an early age, um, we had this sense <coughs> of responsibility to give back to our community. And so um, my first <coughs> beginnings with the labor movement were as a... Uh, boycott organizer for the United Farm Workers when I was in high school. And so that was my first entry into uh, the world of politics, the world of organizing. And uh, I was inspired by Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez and of the untold Filipino farm workers who actually led the Delano Grape Strike back in 1965. So uh, I was able to claim that part of my Asian American identity and history to respect and appreciate the role of Asian American workers in fighting for and building unions in this country. Uh, so it was actually a merger of the Filipino farm labor organization and the Mexican American farm labor organization that brought to birth the United Farm Workers of America. And to this day, pe very few people recognize that it was the Filipino workers that first launched the Delano Grape Strike and that the UFW was a merged organization that brought together Filipino and Mexican American workers together. Um, so that was my beginnings. I um, um, went to law school. I uh, worked as the first staff attorney for Asian Americans Advancing Justice here in Los Angeles. I worked as staff attorney for the Service Employees International Union at a very exciting time when the Justice for Janitors campaign was um, getting launched and the home care organizing campaign that has successfully organized over 300,000 home care workers in the state of California uh, mainly women, mainly people of color, all low-wage workers. Uh, so I've seen the power of organizing. I've seen what workers can do when they stand together and fight back and organize. And um, I think that we in California are very fortunate to be able to tap in to a wealth of organizing victories that absolutely need to be replicated throughout the country. 
have a question. So labor unions comprise 11% of the U.S. workforce. Why is that number so low? The number is low for a number of reasons. Uh, at the height of the labor movement back in the 50s and 60s, we had about 35% union density. So about one in three American worker was a member of a union back 60 years ago. Today, it's about one in 10, 11%. We've seen, as I indicated, a massive transformation from a manufacturing-based economy where uh, the growth of industrial unions back in the 1930s first began to a situation now where uh, service workers and information workers uh, comprise the majority of the workforce and primarily in low-wage, non-union industries. 50 years ago, the largest employer in the country was General Motors. Because of the strength of the United Auto Workers, the auto industry provided middle-class jobs, and workers in that industry could buy homes, could have full family medical care, could take vacations, had sick pay, and had a pension at the end of their careers. Today, the largest employer in the country and the world is Walmart. They are fiercely anti-union, as Brave New, Fe Brave New Films has documented, and uh, have uh, engaged in a race to the bottom, where no longer is General Motors the standard bearer for U.S. corporations. Today, Walmart is the standard bearer, and they have pushed out small businesses, they have uh, uh, engaged in horrendous anti-union campaigns, and you can work your entire life at Walmart and never emerge beyond a poverty existence. Mm -hmm. So forget about full family medical care, forget about uh, pensions, forget about having uh, a middle class existence that does no longer exist in Walmart and in large parts of the US economy. If you look at most of the major corporations today, it's, it's big box and it's fast foods. And those are all poverty wage, non-union jobs. We had a question. Um, Darren Ray. 1930s, not only did that benefit workers within unions, it benefited workers across the board because unions fought for and won progressive policies that protected worker interests and that represented economic justice. So all of the legislation that is now under attack by the current regime, from health and safety standards, environmental standards, minimum wage, pensions, vacation pay, sick pay, these were all fought for and won by the labor movement. And they are now systematically being undermined. Even basic things like the 40-hour work week is no longer in existence. Um, we just completed a study of the gig economy, and we have documented the horrendous abuse of workers who drive for Lyft and Uber, who are miscalculated as contract mm -hmm. contractors, even though they're workers. They have no control over their pay, they have no control over their work conditions, um, and there's all of these hidden subsidies that they pay in to provide billions of profits for Uber and Lyft, mm -hmm. uh, they pay for their own car, they pay for their own insurance, they pay for, they don't have sick days, they don't have vacation days, they don't have, forget about a pension, and they work longer and longer hours just in order to make ends meet. Uh, so, you know, the gig economy is great for, um, for the, the wealthy few and great for the corporations, but it is really uh, causing tremendous hardship for um, uh, workers.
Um, we just celebrated last year the 25th anniversary of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. And uh, I was the founding president. I went all over, across the country to build chapters of APALA in order to bring uh, the voice of progressive unions to the Asian American community and in order to bring Asian workers into the U.S. labor movement. And uh, what's been very exciting over the course of this period of time is that we've seen not only a huge growth and explosion of the number of Asian Americans throughout the country, but we also have seen uh, growing Asian American activism. And uh, that has yielded results. And so if you look at the polling data, um, Asian Americans uh, voted in higher numbers for Hillary Clinton than Latinos, you know? So, uh, you know, overall, African Americans by far the top, and then um, Asians and then Latinos. And so, you know, it was well into the 70% in terms of those who are voting, um, uh, you know, with a more progressive candidate than the other. Um, that being said, uh, within the Asian American community, we have huge economic polarization. We have a large group of um, small business owners, we have a large group of entrepreneurs, and we have massive poverty rates and poverty levels. And we have a very segmented community where uh, you know, the term Asian American only exists in this country. It is a cultural construct. And if you talk to Koreans, they would never want to be identified with Japanese. I mean, right. my God. Um, so uh, it is a political uh, grouping that has helped to inform uh, multiple Asian subgroups of our common role within our society. And historically, that has been as a source of cheap labor and as a, um, as a dispensable part of the workforce and as a group that has been subject to extreme discrimination and racism. Uh, that being said, you have multiple generations of Asian Americans who don't know that history. And so our role for the third, fourth, and fifth generation is to make sure that we educate uh, others within our community, which is what Apala does. And so um, it's very important that we talk about the very existence of Asian America today is a result of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. We owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Martin Luther King and to the civil rights movement that challenged racial injustice and challenged discriminatory laws, including immigration policies. So it was only in 1965 that racist policies that kept Asians out of this country all the way back from 1882 were overturned precisely because of the civil rights movement. So we need to go out educate those folks in Koreatown that like, hey, you wouldn't even be here had it not been for the civil rights movement and you should be standing with communities of color and demanding affordable housing, demanding economic justice, demanding living wage jobs, and not supporting the landlords. You know, it is not your interest to support landlords and uh, corporations. You should be supporting the people that brought you to this country. I just wanted to start by saying that this is a very difficult time for immigrants across this country. There is tremendous fear, there's tremendous anxiety, there's tremendous trauma within uh, immigrant spaces. And uh, uh, the UCLA Labor Center has been at the forefront of fighting for, representing, defending the interests of immigrant workers and immigrant youth. And that, you know, for the last eight years, we've run a program called Dream Summer which has raised over $4 million for scholarships and fellowships for undocumented immigrant youth and has propelled a new generation of immigrant youth activists. There is now a small group of um, former you know, uh, employees who 
uh, feel resentful that they were not given enough support, were not given enough um, um, funding at, at, you know, when they worked um, at the Dream Resource Center. And we feel very bad about that. You know, we feel like, you know, we wish we could have uh, provided more career positions. We wish we could have provided more funding. Um, and, you know, uh, we are very sympathetic to a source, a sense of feeling injured. And in that I think that's a very prevalent view in immigrant communities. Um, at the same time, you know, there were a lot of allegations that circulate in these uh, social media settings which aren't true and which kind of spin off each other to make it appear that all of these allegations are true. And so we are very interested in trying to continue to do the work we've done historically to fight for immigrant rights, to fight for women's rights, to um, you know, provide opportunities for all. The reality is that the vast majority of our staff uh, have, are women. The vast majority of the participants in Dream Summer have been women. Um, and that we are absolutely committed to you know, gender equity and racial justice. But you know, we're not perfect. And uh, not everybody who has gone through this space uh, had a good experience. So for that, we're sorry. possibilities for effectiveness, for winning some fights, and to the you know, audience, what you encourage people to do personally in their organizations, in their schools, etc. Well, I'm of a reemergence of social movements, and I see more activism on campus and the communities that I've seen in a long time. So I get inspiration from the striking teachers throughout the country. I get inspiration from the Parkland students and for a new generation of high school youth who are calling out the NRA and calling out the corporate interests that profit from mass killing. And that every time there's a mass killing, more people buy guns. And so there's an interest in the NRA to do everything they can to arm more teachers, to have more guns, so that everybody should have many guns. You know, that's their line because they make profit off mass killings. So um, I think that the work of the immigrant rights movement, the immigrant youth movement, the work of the women's movement, uh, the work of the LGBT movement, there is no shortage of opportunities for people to get engaged and to get involved. And uh, uh, things don't change on their own. And uh, a lot of people talk about how, well, California is leading the resistance because of a demographic shift. and. Now there's more people of color, so naturally California is more progressive. That's not the case. We've had demographic shifts in Texas. We've had demographic shifts in Florida. Uh, there has to be an organizing agenda that is embraced. There has to be vibrant unions. There has to be strong movements within communities of color, within women's movements. And uh, that's what makes the difference. And so uh, for this new generation of young people who are getting involved all across the country, hang in there. I mean, this is the time when you can assume leadership. Um, and what's so powerful about being able to work with someone like, you know, Reverend Lawson is that uh, someone from his vantage point who has seen, um, you know, massive movements, has seen massive repression, has seen uh, you know, generations who have uh, uh, struggled and sacrificed against much bigger obstacles than we face today. Uh, and that uh, in spite of it all, in spite of 89 years, he still uh, retains this sense of hope and optimism for the future. So um, he's my role model, and uh, I think that all of us can learn from uh, people who have gone before us and who have gone against much bigger obstacles than what we face today.
feels like there's such a divide with those two, and either people don't know the right information or they don't know what to do. And I don't know how you handle that in kind of your everyday <coughs> work. Well, this is a historic challenge. How do we integrate theory and practice? How do we integrate education and action? And you know, as director of the UCLA Labor Center, we grapple with these questions every day. Uh, we work with young people. We teach them in the classroom, but we also encourage them to get out in the real world, to experience, to get involved, to participate in the social movements around us. That is part of your valuable education. You will learn as much doing that, that than what you learn in the classroom. But read, <laughs> study, mm -hmm. learn, and don't assume that just by getting involved in social movements alone, that will give you all the answers. So this is the challenge of, we encourage study, we encourage learning, we encourage getting out the books and drawing from historic precedent and historic experience. But each generation has to wage their own battles and their own struggles. So draw from history, draw from the lessons of the past, but try it out. Don't just stay in the ivory tower and think that, you know, writing academic articles is going to save the world. It's not. It can help, it can help inform, but unless we really have that nexus between theory and practice, education and action, we're missing the boat. Well, thank you. Um, thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Mr. Kent Wong, for coming. We really appreciate it, and all of your knowledge is um, just so great to know about. Happy to be here, thank yeah. you. Yes, um, I'm. I'm happy. You know, I'm happy to ask.